Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to How to Read a Slave Narrative, an online professional development seminar from the National Humanities Center. I'm Richard Schramm, Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating the session this evening. Before we get underway, I'd like to spend a minute just to introduce the National, National Humanities Center to you. Some of you may be familiar with the center, but I suspect most of you aren't. Let me begin by saying that it's located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina, tucked in among the cities of Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. What that mouthful means simply is that we're independent, we're a private nonprofit organization, we're an institute for advanced study, which means that our main program is a fellowship program that brings college and university professors to the center, usually for an academic year, to research and write on the humanities. Topics in history, literature and language study, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978. Since then, we've had about 1,100 scholars work here. And as a result of their research done at the center, about 1,200 books have been published. Now, that makes the place sound like an ivory tower. And from these photographs, you can see uh, that it could pass for an ivory tower. But the center's founders didn't want it to be an ivory tower. They wanted it to connect with a wide array of audiences. And they were particularly interested in connecting with teachers. And we do that these days in three ways. Our online seminars, teacher serve, and our toolbox library. Now, you folks have discovered our online seminars, and we're delighted to have you with us tonight. As you see, there are several more scheduled throughout the fall and spring. We hope you'll join us again. Uh, if you do want to sign up for any additional seminars, please do so. They are all filling up rather quickly. We offer a thing called TeacherServe, which is an umbrella uh, site that contains three instructional guides, Divining America, Religion in American History, Nature Transformed, The Environment in American History, and Freedom Story, Teaching African American Literature and History. These consist of essays written by leading scholars on topics that would be germane in the high school classroom in those three areas. The essays not only illuminate topics, but they also offer advice on how to teach them. Let me call your attention particularly to Freedom Story and this section right here, the 1609-1685 section. Uh, that contains a lot of essays on slavery. It contains the essays that you read uh, tonight uh, for this session, How to Read a Slave Narrative. It also contains an essay on uh, uh, Harriet Jacobs and Frederick Douglass. Uh, the other section, 1865 to 1917, contains an essay that you might be interested in as well, Reconstruction and the Formerly Enslaved. Our toolboxes <clears throat> contain primary sources, historical documents, literary text, images, audio material. They're organized thematically with chronological frames, and, that which are, and those uh, texts are illuminated by extensive notes and interpretive questions. They're ideal for classroom instruction. Here again, let me call your attention to one of them, The Making of African American Identity, Volume 1, 1500 to 1865. This has extensive primary documents on slavery. I invite you to use them. I think you'll be able to uh, uh, open up some new territory for your students with these primary documents. If you want to keep track of uh, new seminars and new online resources, we urge you to become a fan of the National Humanities Center's education programs on our Facebook page. That way we'll be able to uh, get in touch with you when something new appears from the Humanities Center. Now, when the session is over this evening, you'll be able to find a recording of this presentation along with the PowerPoint on the same site through which you receive your documents for the seminar the How to Read a Slave Narrative site. In addition, you will find an evaluation form on that site. We really urge you to complete that evaluation and submit it to us. You can complete it online and turn it into us online. This is very important to us. We pay attention to what you tell us on those evaluations, and we try to improve the seminars based on what we read there. Now, we will send you a, a letter that uh, indicates that you participated in this seminar. And you can submit that letter to a local certifying authority to obtain whatever recertification your participation in the seminar this evening warrants. Now, let me take a moment just to tell you how the seminar will work. Uh, Professor Andrews will deliver a lecture that will be keyed to presentations of slides with text excerpts that illustrate important points. Some of the excerpts we'll analyze through discussion. Others we will not. 
but I want to emphasize that all the slides are presented as potential instructional tools for your teaching. So if you'd like to plunder our PowerPoint for use in your classes, please feel free to do so. And again, that PowerPoint will be available after the seminar on the How to Teach a Slave Narrative website. Now, how to participate in discussion. Let me show you. If you would like to um, raise your hand to make an oral comment, just click on that little hand raise icon that I'm pointing to with my arrow there. I will see that, and I will pass the microphone to you uh, when I get the opportunity to do so. Right now, all of your microphone icons are red. When the microphone is passed to you and turned on, your microphone icon will turn green. Uh, make your comment, and then click again on that little icon to remove the hand next to your name. If you don't do that, I'm likely to call on you throughout the evening thinking you have a question when, in fact, you don't. If you don't want to use that, you can go down here and send a chat message. Put your cursor in the little box that I'm pointing to now, type out your message, and click the Send button over here. Once you do that, your message will appear in the chat box here above the, uh, the uh, send function. If the chat is scrolling along too fast and it's distracting to you, you can close the chat pane by clicking on that downward pointing arrow right there. You will close the chat, you won't see it. However, you will not miss anything from the chat because as moderator, I'll be reading it and bringing it into the discussion when it's appropriate. If you want to reopen the chat box to send a message, just click on that arrow again and the chat box will pop open, and you'll be able to, uh, to uh, send your message. Now, are there any questions before we begin? If everybody's ready to go, click on that little smiley face icon there, then let me know that uh, you're ready to go. There we go. Several of you have seen that. And you're clicking on it. Great. Wonderful. Okay. Well, let's get underway then. Our goals tonight are simple. We have two goals. First of all, we want to deepen your understanding of slave narratives, and we want to offer you strategies for their presentation in classroom discussion. Now, many of you participated in the forum prior to the seminar, and we've called uh, a number of concerns out of that forum that we'll be covering tonight. First of you, a common theme in the forum was how to make slave narratives accessible to students, and I'm very certain we're going to be able to accommodate that for you this evening. A subset of that, how to make slave narratives something more than just another story about oppressed people. I think we're able to do that tonight because slave narratives focus really on individuals and they, they tell individual stories, and there's a lot more to them than simply uh, a chronicle of oppression. Now, we have done several seminars on slavery here at the National Humanity Center, and this next point is a, is a, a concern that keeps coming up over and over again. Slavery is a difficult topic to teach in the classroom. Students have a strong reaction to it, and teachers are always looking for strategies to help, to help channel the students' uh, anger and, and distress over slavery into illuminating and productive discussion. I don't know if we'll have much to offer on that tonight. We'll certainly try. But if you do have strategies that work, please share them on the form. This is something that teachers grapple with all the time. Finally. We'll look at the common elements that slave narratives share, and we'll also touch upon uh, how slave narratives influenced the slavery debate and how they were influenced by it. To take us through these concerns tonight, we are very pleased to have with us William L. Andrews, who is the E. Maynard Adams Professor of English at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Bill's main areas of research are African American literature and Southern literature. He has written widely on both, as you see there. We couldn't put all of his publications up on the slide. And so now I'm going to pass the presenter's role to him. Let's see if I can do that. Uh, but, okay. There we go. Bill, the seminar is all yours. Thank you, Richard. And hello, everybody. I'm glad to have a chance to be a part of this tonight. I hope that what we talk about will be useful to you, and I hope it uh, give me the feedback that uh, you'd like for me to have while we're while we're talking, so that either through the chat or through actual um, verbal interaction, we'll have a chance to get to the questions that are most on your mind. I'm going to start out by saying just a, a word about slavery. 
uh, when I talk about slave narratives, I do try to explain to uh, classes. Um, this can be students at UNC or or sometimes adults that whom I talk with about uh, the same sort of subject. What is it about slavery that makes it so important for us still to talk about? And I usually say that I believe there are five institutions that have defined America, that have really given America its particular identity and history. Um, in the economic world, it's the institution of capitalism that's given America its special identity. In the uh, religious dimensions of life, I would say it's the institution of Protestant Christianity that has influenced America and really defined in many ways its identity. Um, in terms of the social dimensions of our lives, um, I think that marriage and family are the primary institutions that have made such a huge difference in terms of how Americans think about uh, themselves. And in, and in the world of uh, political life, it's representative democracy that has uh, given America its special identity. Um, and so those four institutions, I think, very much define uh, America for Americans, and in, and in many ways, I think, for people outside of the United States as well. And then I say the fifth institution is slavery, because it perverted the other four, and it did so for many, many generations. And in some ways, uh, the backwash of slavery continues to uh, corrode those institutions. So at the same time that America was saying that it was a representative democracy, of course, as long as slavery existed, uh, America wasn't a representative democracy at all. Um, even, even in the slave states, slaves did not count except as three-fifths of a person. As you know, that was established in the United States Constitution. That wasn't something that the slave states invented. With regard to Protestant Christianity, Slavery uh, certainly uh, threatened the fundamental idea of uh, Protestant Christianity, which was the priesthood of all believers. Um, a slave could not be uh, in any way ordained to any, in any capacity in slavery. And in fact, there were many slaveholders who did not believe that their slaves should have any opportunity for religious instruction at all. Um, it's not uncommon to find references to uh, whites actually questioning whether a people of African descent had souls. Um, with regard to um, the economics of slavery, uh, that certainly challenged and undermined the, uh, the, the very basic notion of capitalism, which is to create a market in which people can freely compete. Well, obviously, slaves could not freely compete in the market at all. They were subjected to the power of others. There was no free market in terms of uh, the United States as long as slavery existed. And, and finally, from the standpoint of the social institution, marriage and family, well, I think everyone knows that under slavery, marriages uh, didn't exist for people of African descent except in very rare cases. There are some recorded cases of actual weddings performed by uh, ordained clergy for slaves. This was a very rare thing. And of course, in the eyes of the law, those marriages still were not, were not something that the law had to observe. So of course, the marriage uh, bond is uh, profoundly compromised by slavery. And then the, the, the whole idea of the family, of the children as, uh, as the children of their parents and their parents responsible for them, uh, that of course is also obliterated in slavery. The children are the property of the man who claims their parents, in particular their mother, as his property. And so um, not only is marriage, but also family uh, made a mockery by the institution of slavery. So, in all of those ways, 
all the four kind of founding institutions of American life were each perverted and corrupted by slavery. And uh, so to me, this is one way to help, help people understand how important it is to understand what slavery was. It was a national institution. It was not a Southern institution because of course its tentacles and influence spread all over the nation. And well into the 19th century, slavery was legal in most states of the North. Uh, so slavery is one of those institutions that is inescapable if we want to understand our American history and our American institutions and what we're still struggling against in many respects, I think, today. So that's my uh, sort of brief overview of why I think slavery is so important to understand um, in, in any context. And certainly, I think it helps to frame what, uh, what I might have to say and what I hope uh, you will also have to say about these narratives. Maybe I should pause and just ask if there are any questions just about what I've said so far. Okay. <clears throat> any questions? Feel free to raise your hand or send in a text message. Okay. I will go ahead then and start talking a little bit about the, the history of the slave narrative in the United States. Um, it begins in 1760, although perhaps appropriately, we do not have a copy of the narrative that appeared uh, in 1760. The, the narrative's actually been lost, but they go back that far. Um, they run through the late 19th century. Interestingly, slave narratives in the, I mean, in, in the late 18th century, it's interesting that slave narratives in the 18th century are uh, all concerned with the experience of slavery in the North. There are no slave narratives that deal with Southern slavery. Uh, and so it's not until 1825 with the uh, life of William Grimes, the runaway slave in 1825 that Northern readers got their first glimpse uh, and a harrowing glimpse it was of what slavery was like for people of African descent in the southern states. Up to, up to 1825, all the narratives of slavery are about slavery in the north if they're written by uh, uh, African Americans. The most uh, powerful and most influential slave narrative um, in the, in the uh, uh, time before Frederick Douglass would have been the Confessions of Nat Turner, which came out in 1831. It was published in Baltimore, um, and it had a huge impact on uh, readership as well as um, as well as on the the ideas that many white people had in the South about how threatening slavery could be. Um, the Nat Turner Rebellion actually precipitated a serious discussion in the Virginia state legislature about gradual emancipation. Unfortunately, the uh, upshot of that discussion was not a relaxation of the institution of slavery and its gradual abolition. The upshot was actually to tighten the institution, to make it more oppressive, to, uh, to deny civil rights what civil rights existed for free people of color to deny those um, in much more um, careful and thoroughgoing ways than had ever been the case before. Um, it's, it's Nat Turner's rebellion that helps to propel into the spotlight the anti-slavery movement that we usually think of today as the abolition movement led by William Lloyd Garrison. and You've seen his name associated with Douglass's narrative. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison uh, begins to publish The Liberator, a, a radical abolitionist weekly, um, only shortly after the, uh, the Nat Turner Rebellion. Uh, and, it's, and it's Garrison who begins to 
argue the radical abolitionist position at that time in 1831, radical because it stated that slavery must end immediately. Uh, the, uh, there were other positions about slavery, such as the idea that somehow we should have a gradual elimination of slavery, uh, sometimes accompanied by uh, the, the argument that somehow governments must compensate slaveholders for their slaves. Um, there's another position that is in favor of so-called colonization. Um, and this, this was a popular movement in the South. There were colonization societies all over the uh, South in the early 19th century. These, these societies were, existed in order to raise money to take uh, people who had been emancipated or manumitted and then send them to Africa to get them out of the United States and convey them to Africa, um, even though, of course, these people had never set foot a day in their lives in Africa and were, were American-born people. Uh, the colonizationists believed that there should be no uh, place uh, in America for people of African descent. And so even though they believed in uh, efforts to free slaves, uh, they did not believe in creating in the United States, in North America, a biracial society. So William Lloyd Garrison was at one point a colonizationist and then repudiated that, repudiated all the other what he would have called halfway measures in order to uh, enunciate uh, what was at that time considered to be a profoundly radical position that slavery must end, it must end now, and there should be no compensation for anyone who's claimed another human being as his or her property. Slavery is simply a deep and abiding moral wrong. According to Garrison, there should be no compromise with slaveholders. Uh, and so Garrison leads the American Anti-Slavery Society into a, uh, a moral uh, crusade against slavery. And it's important to know and it's important uh, to help our students understand that abolitionism was not a popular position to take in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. The average white American in the North was not an abolitionist. Most white Americans in the North didn't ever know any black people, didn't come into contact with black people. Unless they lived in cities, they'd have almost no chance of really meeting any black people. And so they felt that abolitionism was uh, simply about as uh, unimportant to them, about as inconsequential to their lives as slavery itself. Those who did know something about anti-slavery uh, typically thought that anti-slavery people were crackpots or, uh, or undesirables and uh, troublemakers. Um, it was dangerous to be an anti-slavery activist, dangerous for white people, dangerous even more so for African Americans who uh, identified themselves as anti-slavery. Um, so the anti-slavery movement develops in the 1830s led by men like uh, like uh, William Lloyd Garrison, there are less radical organizations that uh, that do not take the Garrisonian position that uh, anti-slavery people should have no contact with the uh, the institutions of government that allow us to change our laws. Uh, instead, uh, there were people who said, "Well, we should work to try to overcome and change the laws." So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, internal controversy and disagreement, and it's it's nevertheless true that by the late 1830s the anti-slavery movement realizes that one thing that they very much need in order to try to change the hearts, not just the minds, but the hearts of white people in the North, is firsthand uh, testimony from people who've been through slavery itself as to what slavery is really like. And it's this realization 
and it's the discovery of people like Frederick Douglass living in the North, who were fugitive slaves, that causes the anti-slavery movement to begin to seek out um, the more eloquent, the more um, uh, effective speakers uh, to get up on lecture platforms and tell their stories of their experience of slavery. And then after a while, these people um, many times are asked either to narrate their stories if they're illiterate or to write them if they're, if they're literate. So that's a little background of the, uh, of the, the circumstances that lead to the rise of a Frederick Douglass. Um, when we look at the title page of the slave narrative, let's start out with uh, Douglass's narrative. The, the title page itself, as I hope you can see, reads narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave written by himself. And then it gives the publisher, that's the anti-slavery office in Boston. That's, that's William Lloyd Garrison's own press. That's where the Liberator was um, printed and published uh, every week during the uh, 1840s. And there's the date, 1845. Um, <coughs> excuse me, the, the word narrative, of course, means that this is going to be a factual account. This is not a, uh, a fiction. This is not a novel. This is a narrative, and the narrative is going to be of someone's life. It's going to be the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. Um, the striking thing about this title page is written by himself. That little phrase speaks volumes to the reader who picks this book up for the first time. Because there's a fundamental contradiction between what most white people think in 1845 about an American slave and this very title page. They think that an American slave is someone who is so inarticulate, who is, whose mind is so weak, um, whose knowledge is so slight, that he couldn't possibly write anything himself. And indeed, he probably doesn't really have a narrative to tell because there's nothing really to tell other than that he's been a slave. And so the very title page militates against this idea, especially the statement written by himself, because th this says that to the reader, well, you may think that people of African descent are incapable of letters are incapable of learning. Uh, this was a frequently uh, used myth by pro-slavery people to say um, people who are so-called uh, white are, uh, are capable intellectually of doing things that so-called black people are not capable of doing. So here we have a title that says written by himself. I, I think that written by himself not only means it's by Frederick Douglass, it also implies a certain kind of independence written by himself, not with somebody else, but by himself alone. And so it's a statement of literary independence as well as a statement of literary agency. Let me go back, uh, let me go forward uh, to the title page of Douglas's second autobiography. If you'll have a look at Slide 26, this is the title page of the 1855 version of Douglass's autobiography, which he entitled My Bondage and My Freedom. This is a much bigger book than the narrative. The narrative is a relatively short text. I think many of you are familiar with the narrative. Some of you may be familiar with My Bondage and My Freedom. Just look at the title page of My Bondage and My Freedom. Um, now it says it's by Frederick Douglass. It's not the narrative of Frederick Douglass. It's by Frederick Douglass. And we have an introduction by Dr. James McCune Smith. Um, the, uh, the publisher is also different. This is a commercial publisher. This is a commercial publisher with a very progressive bent, but it is still a commercial publisher. This is not an abolition society publishing this autobiography. 
if one knew who wrote the introduction to Douglas's narrative of 1845, one knew that, J that William Lloyd Garrison wrote it, and one would know that if one simply looked through the text, because his, his name's right there after the preface, um, then looking at my bondage and my freedom would be very interesting just from the title page, because William Lloyd Garrison isn't writing the introduction this time. In fact, the man who's writing this introduction is an African-American, not a white man. And that's a signal decision on Douglas's part, not to have a white man introduce his autobiography, his second autobiography, but to have a black man do it. Notice also there's a, uh, there's a frontispiece for the 1855 edition of Douglas's autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom. Notice the photograph is a very striking photograph. I think primarily because Douglas is dressed clearly as a white collar uh, gentleman. He is not a fugitive slave. He is not just some anybody. He's a somebody. He's an internationally known figure, uh, famous as a lecturer, and and now by 1855, famous as a, uh, the editor of a newspaper of his own. Um, then there's his autograph, which of course is important in terms of uh, establishing one's peculiar singular identity for all of us. It's a marker of our individuality that each one of us has his or her own autograph. So um, there are clues just on the title page, My Bondage and My Freedom, of how it's going to be a different kind of book from Douglass's narrative. And if you've never read My Bondage and My Freedom, uh, but you have read the narrative, well, I strongly recommend that you read My Bondage and My Freedom. We will look at a few differences between the two books that are just good samples of the ways that Douglas changes between 1845 and 1855. And, uh, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Let's go back to the title page of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. Think about this in light of the, the text of Douglas that we were looking at. So here we have Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl written by herself. And then there are two quotations there, one from Isaiah and, uh, and one not attributed, um, and then edited by L. Maria Child, Boston, published for the author, 1861. So notice, notice the, uh, the differences between this title page and Douglas's title page. Uh, anybody want to say anything about the difference between this and Douglass's uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave? Okay. What differences do we see here? Any takers? Okay, no picture of her for one. Uh, we don't know the girl's name. Exactly. Okay. Anything, Anything else? The fact that the that the uh, author's name does not appear is important. We see written by herself, um, but uh, but the fact that there's no name here instead we get edited by L. Maria Child. Lydia Maria Child was a very prominent uh, white woman, author, very active in the anti-slavery movement. So people who were in progressive circles, either um, women's rights advocates or um, anti-slavery advocates would have seen L. Maria Child and said, oh, that's somebody. But notice too, Boston, yes, published for the author. Um, it is important to recognize that whereas Douglas has a as an anti-slavery society behind him, publishing his autobiography. And then by 1855, he's got a commercial publisher wants to publish him. In 1861, the author of Incidents 
asked to publish this book for herself. Um, and, and this says a little bit about the difficulties, this whole title page says a little bit about the difficulties that this woman author faces. She, for some reason, does not want to reveal her name. She is happy to reveal the name of her white editor, but she doesn't want to reveal her own name. 1861 is significant because the book comes out just a few months before the beginning of the Civil War. And it's one reason we think why this book never went into a second printing in the United States. It was more or less overwhelmed by the events of the, of the war and uh, people became so caught up in all of that that they did not read this book. This book was published in England but um, but it, it whereas Frederick Douglass's narrative, it's estimated that 30,000 copies were sold from 1845 up through the 1850s. Um, this narrative, Incidents in Life of a Slave Girl, um, did not achieve a wide readership at all. Now, um, I want to say a couple words about incidents because we'll be talking about it off and on. The author of Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl was a woman named Harriet Jacobs. Some of you know her whole story. Uh, some of you may not. Harriet Jacobs came from Edenton, North Carolina. She was a slave from the day she was born. And she grew up a slave and lived in slavery until she was 27 years old. The, the basic aspects of her life that were so shocking and indeed scandalous that she really didn't want to tell her story. She certainly didn't want to publish her story and didn't do it until many years after she had escaped to the North um, were such that she decided not only not to put her name on the cover of the book, but also to write under a pseudonym so in Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, she identifies herself as Linda Brent, not Harriet Jacobs. And she also takes the names of every other person, almost every other, well, all the other people in her, her life in Edenton, North Carolina, are given pseudonyms as well. So she, she writes about her life, but she never says, I'm from Edenton, North Carolina. She does not identify her uh, hometown and where much of the narrative is set. When she gets to the North, the people who help her are almost all also given different names. Um, why does she do this? Because she is number one, uh, afraid of being uh, uh, caught as a fugitive slave. And number two, there are aspects of her life in her narrative that as a woman in the late 1850s, early 1860s, she still feels very conflicted about talking about at all. Mm -hmm. Bill, we have um, some questions about the use of the word girl. Mm -hmm. Comment on that. Why not instance in the life of a slave woman? I think, I think partly because Jacobs wants to emphasize how much of the struggle that she had uh, against slavery, against those who would exploit her, took place when she was a girl, when she was a teenager. And one of the things I think that can make certain aspects of her narrative impressive for um, students in secondary school today is to, is to encourage them to read the parts of, the, of incidents that do deal with her life as a girl. Um, she is... Uh, is especially good, I think Jacobs is especially good at talking about what it's like um, to be a teenager, to be uh, the, 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 uh, a girl who is as early as the age of 14 um, being sexually harassed by a white man whom she names in the book, Dr. Flint. So it's, um, it's, it's a story that um, many people in 1861, even in the anti-slavery movement, 
would not have wanted to read. They knew about sexual harassment. They knew how white men um, exploited black women uh, sexually, but they didn't want to read about it. They didn't want to face it. Uh, at the same time, this narrative does not present this slave girl as merely a girl who's a victim. She does not present herself that way. And as we move along in this discussion, we'll see ways that she um, refuses to accept simply the role of victim. I think sometimes um, students today resist reading about slavery because they don't want to read simply about miserable people who've been victimized and oppressed. I think that the narratives of Harriet Jacobs as a woman and of Frederick Douglass as a man say a lot about the ways that people were able to express their individuality, um, stand up for themselves, and, um, and maintain a degree of dignity even in the middle of their enslavement uh, as they were resisting efforts by whites to, uh, to um, oppress them to the point where they wouldn't emphasize or insist on their own selfhood, their own rights, their own dignity. So that may be something teachers could use to help students work through the, the, the anger and, and rage they feel about uh, slavery in general. Well, I, I think so. Now we have a question here from Judith Batten. If uh, um, Harry Jacobs didn't want to this story known, why did she write it and publish it? Was she did 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 a, an abolition society come to her and ask her to tell her story, or is this something that she sort of volunteered? Um, this was not something that she wanted to talk about. Um, there is a wonderful letter um, in which Harriet Jacobs explains to Lydia Maria Child. This is uh, while Child and Jacobs are working together on um, Jacobs' autobiography. While they're working on incidents, Jacobs tells Lydia Child um, that I never wanted to tell this story. Uh, but um, uh, Amy Post, uh, another white um, anti-slavery woman and women's rights activist, kept gently asking her, would you consider telling your story? Would you consider writing your autobiography? You know and I know that there are many, many women in the South, women of color in the South, who have been through uh, experiences similar to yours. We've got to expose this. We can't just keep a circle of silence around this. Won't you be the one to speak out and talk about it as only you can because you've lived it and you know what it's like. And gradually, she was able to convince Jacobs to do this, but the only basis on which Jacobs would do it would be to hide her own identity, to try to make it as difficult as possible to um, determine who the slave girl is and what her family is and where she comes from and so on. So she was gently recruited, you might say. She was, she was. Okay, we've got about 45 minutes remaining. So um, those, are the, those are the title pages. Then there are uh, interesting things about the prefaces and introductions to slave narratives that we ought to touch on just for a minute. Um, here's a quotation. I don't think we need to read the whole thing, but uh, it's a quotation by William Lloyd Garrison that you read before you get to Frederick Douglass's narrative. And the, the quotation that I've selected has to do with Garrison's acknowledging that Douglass has chosen to write his own narrative. And then Garrison says, I am confident that is essentially true in all its statements. Nothing has been set down in malice, nothing exaggerated, nothing drawn from the imagination. That it comes short of the reality rather than overstates a single fact in regard to slavery as it is. What's striking about a preface like this is that it's as though it's assumed, even on the part of an anti-slavery society, that this slave narrative needs a kind of endorsement, uh, a kind of character reference, 
before you start reading the narrative of the author himself. Um, it's not that there are no white autobiographies that have introductions, but most white autobiographies don't have introductions, and the ones that do almost never have anybody telling you that, you know what, you can believe that this stuff is really true. Um, it's just not treated that way. So here's an indication, even an anti-slavery society, the, the, the most liberal people of the time in terms of the white population on race still feel that somehow they need to step in and say uh, to the reader, you can believe this, uh, I'm vouching for him. Um, and so th th this is an indication of the fact that we have a, uh, a, a reader that uh, of these narratives who, who's likely to be starting out with an assumption that, well, this, this narrative is probably not true or this narrative is going to have a lot of exaggeration, or it's not going to really tell me the truth about slavery. It's going to, it's going to be a, a subject to an agenda. And so Garrison's there to say, well, there's no agenda. Bill, if I could ask a, if you put, interpose a question here that's coming sure. in the chat. Uh, how necessary was it to influence Northerners in 1861 as opposed to the 1840s and 1850s? How far along had the abolition movement come by 1861, in other words? Um, the abolition movement had come a long ways in terms of drawing people to support the basic premise that slavery was wrong. And, and for most people in the 1840s and 50s, the image of uh, the slave is male, and uh, the image is male because those are the people they see. Those are the people who stand up on the platforms. Those are the people whose autobiographies are solicited. What happens in 1861 is we really get a breakthrough. We have an African-American woman who actually writes her own autobiography and who tells a story that um, no man could tell. And one could say that it, it, it took that long before the uh, the 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 opportunity really presented itself in the form of someone like Harry Jacobs, um, who, though she never had a day of schooling in her life, was literate, um, needed an editor the way lots of people need editors to help them write their stories. But um, it's, it's very hard to imagine a story like Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl being published, say, before Frederick Douglass's narrative. That, that, that just wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So um, just to point to the uh, preface that James McCune Smith writes, again, James McCune Smith is a black man, and in 1855, he was a, an outspoken critic of William Beloyd Garrison. Uh, that doesn't mean that he was opposed to uh, Garrison's stand against slavery. Uh, Smith was a very decided anti-slavery man. But he didn't approve of Garrison's position. So it says something that Douglas picks a man who really disagrees with the man who wrote the preface to his first narrative. You'll notice that McCune Smith says about Douglas's second autobiography, it is an American book for Americans in the fullest sense of the idea. He's really trying to say this is uh, not just a book about slavery. This is not just a book that you need to read if you want to find out what's going on in the in the corrupt uh, South with its hideous institutions of slavery and human bondage. Um, this is a this is an American book. Every American should read this. All people will be fulfilled by the example of this man. So Smith is trying to um, sort of promote Douglas from the status of fugitive slave to the status of kind of American hero. When you go to the, the next slide, this is a selection from the preface uh, or the introduction that Lydia Maria Child wrote. And notice again, she also is doing a bit of a, a kind of a character witness for Jacobs. The author of the following autobiography is personally known to me 
and her conversation and manners inspire me with confidence. During the last 17 years, she has lived the greater part of the time with a distinguished family in New York and has so deported herself as to be highly esteemed by them. This fact is sufficient without further credentials of her character. I believe those who know her will not be disposed to doubt her veracity, though some incidents in her story are more romantic than fiction. When she says romantic, she doesn't mean romantic as in uh, the, uh, uh, the sort of romance tradition of, uh, of uh, Hearts and Flowers. She's, she's talking about stuff that's uh, more hard to believe than even fiction itself. But again, Child is trying very hard to confirm before the story even gets underway that you can believe this story, white reader, uh, and, uh, and thus a child fulfills the role. Bill, let me ask a question here. We have, uh, have a good question that came in in the chat, and the person was asking about it in connection with uh, uh, <clears throat> Garrison's introduction to Douglas's narrative, but it really applies to all of the introductions we've seen. If the people writing these introductions are abolitionists, and they're known as abolitionists, then mm -hmm. are, is the audience um, going to feel they're trustworthy, or are they going to think, well, this is special pleading? Um, it, it does depend on the audience. Uh, certainly abolitionists read other abolitionists. And if you went to a, uh, an abolitionist rally and they were selling copies of Frederick Douglass's narrative, you, you might be uh, an anti-slavery person yourself, or you might be leaning in that direction. And if you hear an effective speech, that might make you curious enough to want to read the, the narrative itself. Um, but it's certainly true that even as anti-slavery moved closer into the mainstream by the 1850s, there were still plenty of people who would never have gone to an anti-slavery rally and therefore would have been unlikely to encounter these, these books. These books were not sold in, in uh, bookstores the way uh, a book of essays by um, Emerson or a Herman Melville novel. Um, most of these narratives were not sold in that way. They were not commercial in that way. The, the, an exception would be would be uh, my bondage and my freedom, because the uh, publisher there is a commercial publisher and would have outlets. Harriet Jacobs would have been dependent on uh, her friends and the anti-slavery movement to circulate her her books. Okay. Thank you. Um, when we think about how slave narratives begin, if I was going to teach one short passage from uh, a slave narrative, this might be the passage. This is, this is the better part of the opening paragraph of Frederick Douglass's 1845 narrative. And it's a, it's a very rich piece of writing and says a great deal about the author in a very compressed place. As you can see, he starts out by locating himself. He says, I was born, where I was born. And then he says, quite remarkably, I have no accurate knowledge of my age, have it, never having seen any authentic record containing it. So right from the beginning, in an autobiography, he's telling you, I don't know something that almost any autobiographer would know, and that is when I was born and how old I am. Uh, in other words, he doesn't know his own birthday. And there's evidence that Douglas spent um, his entire lifetime trying to triangulate to the place where he could actually tell how old he was. Um, so he says, he says that he doesn't have this information. And then the paragraph goes on from there to explain what the effect of that was on him. Now, what is, the, what is the reason why you would not want someone to know how old they are? Okay. <clears throat> what, what, why might you want to keep that, uh, that information hidden from people? And takers out there, while we're waiting, why don't you note Les Kahn notes that he's taught this paragraph to his classes with good results. So it, has, uh, it works both in college and in high school. So why would you not want to tell someone or let somebody know when they were born? Control, no coming of age or entering adulthood. Definitely a control mechanism. 
-hmm. Definitely. Um, if we think about why, why is having a birthday so important? Why yeah, do kids want to want people to know their birthdays? Well, it certainly gives people a sense of identity and who they are, That's and it right. underscores family. Uh, there's exactly. saying identity. It is a so celebration. Being, being. Precisely. It's a milestone in your life. I agree. It singles you out as an individual. Exactly. Well, if you don't have a birthday, then you can't say, I am this particular person born on this particular date. It also, yeah, it, it, it alienates you from all the people who do know their birthdays. Mm -hmm. It makes you different and it makes you lack something. Now, all of that is deliberate in slavery. What is the whole purpose of slavery in terms of the psychological conditioning, but to condition you to believe that you aren't an individual, that you don't have any special origin, that you aren't somebody, you're just anybody. So what does Douglas do with this? As you go through the paragraph, he says, all right, lots of slaves are ignorant of their birthday. And then he tries to turn that disadvantage what I would call that deliberate disadvantage into an advantage, a want of information concerning my own, that is his birthday, was a source of unhappiness to me even during childhood. So this would seem to be exactly what slavery wants, wants to make you unhappy, wants to make you unfulfilled. But then notice he says the white children could tell their ages I could not tell why I ought to be deprived of the same privilege. And so here we see that young Fred did not compare himself to his other black contemporaries on the plantation in Maryland on the Eastern shore where they didn't know their ages. No, he said, why am I not like the white children? And so he begins to ask questions that Slavery's not designed to inspire. Slavery is designed to take those questions out of someone, not to encourage those questions to be asked. And so I was not allowed to make any inquiries of my master concerning it. He deemed all such inquiries on the part of a slave improper and impertinent and evidence of a restless spirit. And I think that's the, that's the remarkable ending. This this little boy, who's who's been raised in slavery, really, slavery is designed to despirit you. It's designed to take the spirit out of you. It's designed to deindividualize you. Actually, takes what slavery has taken away from him and says, "That's what I want," and my spirit is going in quest of it. I'm going to be restless until I can get that information, that key information about myself. So I think this is a, a great passage to, uh, to show students. Uh, and, uh, and, and I see that several people have, have, have used this. Yes, it certainly does indicate that from the restless spirit, there's going to be, there's going to be trouble. We're not going to get a contented slave here. Being ignorant of yourself is not going to make a slave more satisfied with his situation. It's going to make him less and less satisfied. So the ironies abound the farther we read. If you want to look at the next passage, let's just look at how Harry Jacobs begins her narrative. Reader, be assured this narrative is no fiction. Well, a narrative isn't fiction. That's why, why the word narrative was used to describe autobiographies. So she's on the defensive from the minute she starts her narrative. Be assured this narrative is no fiction. I am aware that some of my adventures may seem incredible, but they are nevertheless strictly true. I have not exaggerated the wrongs inflicted by slavery. On the contrary, my description falls far short of the facts. So here is an interesting paradox. In order to convince people that I'm telling the truth, I'm not going to tell the whole truth. I'm going to fall short of the facts in order to get people to believe that I'm giving them the facts. This is the kind of paradoxical bind 
a slave narrator finds himself or herself in. How much can I tell white people before they stop believing me? How much can I negotiate with this inherently suspicious and racist reader uh, so that I can get them to believe what I need them to believe without telling them things that will so alienate them that they'll stop reading and won't believe a word I say? So it's a, it's a tremendously complicated position to be in um, if you're a slave narrator and you start out knowing that your reader doesn't believe you and is just waiting for you to make some move, to make some statement, to show some emotion that will cause the reader to say, I knew I couldn't believe this. I don't believe that. It's completely false. Uh, it's all over. I'm not going to read anymore. So. Here's Douglas in uh, this, what is the plot of most pre-Civil War slave narratives. I selected this passage because it is actually taken from the very early months of Douglas's abolitionist career. He writes about that in My Bondage and My Freedom. He doesn't write about it at all in the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, an American slave. He certainly had been on the anti-slavery movement for four years when he wrote about when he wrote the narrative in 1845. He didn't write about any of this in the narrative. He couldn't really write about it until he got to 1855. So the, the story that they want him to tell as he goes up on the abolitionist platform, all of these people he's talking about here are all white people. My speeches were almost in, exclusively made up of narrations of my own personal experience as a slave. That's what we want in our in our slave narrative. Just tell about your personal experience as a slave. Let us have the facts, said the people. We, we already saw Harry Jacobs' problem with giving you the facts. Well, how much fact do you want before you'll say, ah, that can't be true, I don't want to hear any more about it. So also said friend George Foster, who always wished to pin me down to my simple narrative. Give us the facts, said Collins. We will take care of the philosophy. Well, what are the difference between the autobiographical facts and the philosophy? Who gets to put the facts into the narrative and who gets to extract from the facts the philosophy? Well, you can see it's very color coded here. Frederick Douglass, the African American who's been through slavery, provides the facts of his experience of slavery, but it's the white handlers, it's the abolitionist veterans who say, we'll take your facts and then we'll draw out the philosophy from them. Um, so Collins is an anti-slavery uh, activist. He's really sometimes credited as the white man who discovered Frederick Douglass. He heard Frederick Douglass speaking at, in an AME Zion church in New Bedford. Uh, Douglass was a lay, lay minister, and, uh, and Collins came, came to Douglass and said, would you be willing to come and speak at an anti-slavery rally? And, uh, and Douglas was so successful at the speech that Collins then recruited him along with George Foster and William Lloyd Garrison, whom you'll see a little farther down. These are all anti-slavery activists who, um, who recruited Douglas and then became what I'm calling sort of his, his handlers. So when, when Douglas walks up to the platform to speak, uh, Garrison says, tell your story, Frederick. Uh, and then we see Douglas saying, it was getting harder and harder for me just to tell my simple narrative. Um, he wants to do more than just tell a simple story of what it was like to experience slavery, to give you lots of facts about what slavery was. He doesn't want to just uh, narrate, he wants to denounce, he wants to bring his own viewpoints in. He wants to talk about how he feels about this, not just be the purveyor of so many facts. I was growing, he says, and needed room. And so here's the result. Tremendous irony here. People won't believe you ever was a slave, Frederick, if you keep up this way. Be yourself, said Collins, and tell your story. Better have a little of the plantation manner of speech than not. 
Tis not best that you seem too learned. No, would it would it be reading too much into this to say that uh, Douglas is gently, mildly suggesting that the abolitionists were using him in rather the same way the slaves were? Of course, you know, given the fact that it wasn't uh, anywhere near as brutal as slavery. I think that Douglas is saying that there was a kind of paternalism operating in the anti-slavery circles that he had seen uh, in different ways, but in some some remarkably uh, similar ways uh, on the plantation. And if you read My Bondage and My Freedom, you'll see how he depicts paternalism in uh, his experience as a slave, and then lo and behold, it turns out to be uh, a problem that he's got to struggle against all over again in the North, ironically, among the abolitionists. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, he's being told, uh, you need to be very conscious of your audience. You need to tell them what they want to hear. Uh, you can't sound too smart. Uh, you can't sound too articulate. Uh, you may have shuff, uh, you know, shuffled off the plantation manage, manner of speech, but you better readapt it because white people won't believe you if you sound too learned. Okay, quick response to Judith Batten's question. W was he an effective uh, abolitionist? Uh, he was tremendously effective. Okay. He was tremendously popular. Um, but the But the problem was, did he want to be the sort of exhibit A that the anti-slavery people at that time liked for him to be? They they wanted to put him up there, and they would say this is a uh, this is a representative of the South's peculiar institution with his uh, he's a he's a graduate of the South's peculiar institution with his diploma written on his back, and uh, and then sometimes people would want to uh, look and see if he had scars from uh, beatings and whippings. Um, he didn't want to be that kind of demonstration uh, model. He, he didn't want to be treated as uh, the object of gawkers. He wanted to be a true orator who not only had uh, his facts, but also had the philosophy and was quite capable of articulating it. And it was, and it was that problem that led him finally to a complete break with William Lloyd Garrison. He just did not want to be Garrison's man anymore. He wanted to be his own man, and he wanted to uh, be the anti-slavery orator and speaker that he wanted to be. We have two questions. Um, one uh, applies really, I think, to all the slave narratives. Um, how much editing was done uh, to the narratives, those written by less learned former slaves, and in general, uh, a quick response to that. We don't know. We have to look at individual narratives. Some, some narratives uh, actually come with prefaces in which the uh, editor will say, or the, uh, the, the, the ghostwriter in some cases will say, um, this man cannot read. What I did was to sit down with him and ask him to tell me his story, and I wrote it down, and then I read it back to him to be sure that I got it right. Um, in other cases, uh, we have people like Harriet Jacobs. We have the, 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 the striking and singular thing about Harriet Jacobs' narrative inc incidents is that uh, we know that Harriet Jacobs was literate because we have letters that she wrote before she wrote incidents. And we know that she could write and could write effectively. She had very little knowledge of punctuation. But as a writer, she was, she was good. And so um, if you read the preface, or rather the introduction of the editor by Lydia Maria Child to Incidents, Child will say exactly what she did to help Harriet Jacobs get published. Um, and it's no different from what editors do all the time to help authors get published. Mm -hmm. So there's a wide range. Um, in the case of Frederick Douglass, we have no idea how much help he received in 1845 um, to, uh, to get his uh, narrative into shape. But it's, it's clear that by 1855, he'd had so much experience as a newspaper editor as well as a speaker that, uh, that he didn't need any, he didn't need any um, uh, help at all. 
did he did he break with Garrison? Uh, in the early 1850s, about 1853, I think, that he and Garrison uh, broke. Uh, Douglas had developed profound differences with Garrison philosophically, and uh, he just it, it started when Douglas said, "I want to uh, start my own newspaper." You can read about um, Douglas's uh, conflict with the Garrisonians over Douglas. Um, saying, you know, I want to edit a newspaper. Uh, and Garrison's people say, well, why do you want to edit a newspaper? We've already got a newspaper. Uh, the Liberator, that's fine. We don't need another newspaper. Douglas felt that what they were really telling him was, uh, black people don't need to be editors. You could be speakers. That's what we need you for. Uh, we don't need you to be, an, uh, be a, a, a source of competition. Uh, we need you to play the role in the movement that we want you to play. Right, right. Okay, good. We got about twenty minutes left. So um, let's let's skip over the passage from uh, from Harriet Jacobs. Um, the only reason I put that in, and if I had more time, I might be able to spend some time on it. But what I would suggest for you is um, when you look at that passage about her experience of, of racism uh, in Rockaway, Long Island, um, it raises the question of what happens in these stories when someone has escaped and you think the plot should be winding up, they've escaped, they've successfully gotten to the north and they've got their freedom now. Uh, but if you read Harry Jacobs' incidents, you'll find but there's a great deal of the story that's still concerned with her life after she gets to the North. Uh, and that's partly because she doesn't have her freedom. She's a fugitive slave. And that means she has to be very careful about where she goes and whom she's seen with. Um, and also there's a great irony in that she encounters a good deal of racism in the North that she wasn't expecting. So that tends to raise a question about what sort of is the plot of these stories, where are these stories going? The turning point is another interesting question to ask about slave narratives. Sometimes it's nice to have a narrator who will tell you, like Frederick Douglass when he says in the, in the 1845 narrative, this battle with Mr. Colby was the turning point in my career as a slave. Well, that's, that's nice of him to tell us, so now we know. Um, most of you uh, who have read uh, Douglas's narrative know that the battle with Kobe he's talking about is a battle that he had when he was about 17 years old uh, when when uh, Fred was a, a teenager and was uh, sent to work for Edward Kobe, a, uh, a white man who was uh, of very limited means, owned only one slave, and uh, worked as a slave breaker. And Kobe tried to break Fred. Uh, Fred's name was at that time Fred Bailey, and uh, and then um, one morning when Kobe wasn't expecting it, uh, Fred turned around and fought back. So, in some cases, the turning point in a slave narrative is is really a physical uh, battle like this: a battle with Kobe, rekindled the few expiring embers of freedom and revived within me a sense of my own manhood. Um, and so. Douglas actually begins to develop this moment in a way that's highly metaphorical. He calls it a glorious resurrection from the tomb of slavery to the heaven of freedom. You know, we're, we're not just getting the facts here. We're getting Douglas's personal take on it, his personal reflection on how this fight with Kobe changed him, what kind of uh, effect it had on this teenaged a uh, guy who was who was really very demoralized by the way that Kobe had been pushing him around and beating him. Um, my long crushed spirit rose, cowardice departed, bold defiance took its place. So that's one kind of turning point. Uh, even though Douglas hasn't escaped to the north, he won't escape for several more years after this. He still says this was the turning point in my in my life uh, when. Um, when when he fought back against Kobe and insisted, in effect, um, I'm no longer a slave in fact, however much I might be a slave in form. 
Dean Smithwick points out that he's escaped psychologically, and I think that's a good way to put it. Quite true. Quite true. Then the 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 turning point in um, a, a narrative like incidents can be very different. Um, in in incidents, Harriet Jacobs uh, runs away to the north. She she gets a is smuggled aboard ship to Philadelphia, and um, when she gets to the north, she meets a very kind clergyman man in the uh, in the AME church who um, treats her very nicely. Uh, he and his wife both, this Mr. Durham she refers to. And, uh, and then she tells us something, though, that is uh, extremely sensitive, a subject on which I was extremely sensitive. He would ask about my husband next. Uh, Harry Jacobs did not have a husband in slavery. She bore two children by a white man in slavery in Edenton, a man who would be elected to the United States Congress. Of course, these two children were never connected to him formally, though one can't imagine that many people in the town of Edenton didn't know who their father was. Um, so she doesn't want to talk about uh, the father of these children. She doesn't want to talk about the non-existent husband. What would he think of me if I answered him truly? And yet she does so. He asks some further questions. I frankly told him some of the most important events of my life. It was painful for me, for me to do it, but I would not deceive him. If he was desirous of being my friend, I thought he ought to know how far I was worthy of it. And so he compliments her on what he calls your straightforward answers and then cautions her that you shouldn't do this to everybody so openly because it might cause some people to treat you with contempt. Now, it's this sort of advice that causes Jacobs to, or rather reinforces, I think, in Jacobs' own mind, her reticence about talking about what she's been through as a, as a slave in the South, as a female slave. And the, uh, this may again help, help us to understand why it takes her so long to be willing to tell her story in print. Notice how this ends. Um, if I am permitted to have my children, I intend to be a good mother and to live in such a manner that people cannot treat me with contempt. So it may be that what Jacobs is taking us to here is the idea that the turning point in her life is not necessarily when she escapes from the South to the North, but when she's finally able to be a good mother to her children when they and she can be together, and when she can exercise uh, a mother's rights to her own children. We get to the end of slave narratives. It's very interesting to think about uh, how does a narrator choose to end the story? Douglas does not end his story with his arrival in the North. Um, in the narrative of 1845, this is the final paragraph. And if you'll notice, he says that he started going to anti-slavery movements. And when he uh, was attending one in 1841, he felt strongly moved to speak, and it was a time urged to do so by Mr. William C. Coffin, a gentleman who had heard me speak in the Colored People's Meeting in New Bedford. It was a severe cross, and I took it up reluctantly. The truth was I felt myself a slave, and the idea of speaking to white people weighed me down. Then notice he's saying here, even at this point in 1841, years after he's escaped from slavery, he still has something of the psychological burden of the slave mentality to deal with, because the idea of speaking to white people is not appealing to him. Um, that could be partly because of simply knowing that as a black person, white people aren't going to pay attention to him. They're not going to treat him with respect unless he's a very effective speaker. It also could be because standing up in front of all these white people and saying he's a slave is tantamount to saying um, anybody who wants to take me back into slavery, all you have to do is uh, overpower me, kidnap me, and you can make a nice little profit off sending me back to slave. So why would you 
why would you identify yourself to white people? Why would you speak and tell, tell them that you're a slave at all? Uh, why take the risk? But he does speak, and then he says, I felt a degree of freedom and said what I desired with considerable ease. From that time until now, I have been engaged in pleading the cause of my brethren. And so I think what's um, impressive about this ending is that freedom finally comes for Douglas, not physically in the transit from slavery in the South to uh, living in the North, um, but when he gets up on a platform and speaks freely, tells his story in a way that allows him to feel no longer that I have to be silent before white people, that I can speak with ease before anyone, and that, uh, that having done so, he now feels very much committed to pleading the cause of my brethren. When you get to the end of my bondage and my freedom, I'm not going to take the time to go over this, but I recommend that you look at it because the interesting thing at the end of my bondage and my freedom is he's no longer saying my principal job as a speaker uh, is to uh, speak of the importance of emancipation of slaves in the South. You see the beginning of the second paragraph there. It is to improve and elevate the character of the free colored people of the North. And so he promotes their moral, social, religious, and intellectual elevation. Um, so he's made a transition from being an exclusively anti-slavery speaker, um, attacking slavery in a part of the country where he doesn't even live, to a human rights speaker who's talking about how free colored people in the North need to have an advocate. And, uh, and thus he's talking about the world he lives in, the community in which he lives now as a quasi free black man in the North. When you get to the end of uh, Jacob's narrative, these are the last two paragraphs and in incidents. And it's, um, it's uh, very, uh, notable that she says, reader, my story ends with freedom, not in the usual way with marriage. Uh, some of you who know some of the popular 19th century fiction by women would know that, uh, that most of these uh, very popular novels about women's experience would end with marriage. And Jacobs, thus going against the grain, says, my story doesn't end with marriage. It ends with freedom. That's what I want the most. My children and I are now free. Then, then the ironic qualifier, we are as free from the power of slaveholders as are the white people of the North. And though that, according to my ideas, is not saying a great deal, it is a vast improvement in my condition. Then notice what she really wants. It's not just freedom she wants. She wants a home of my own. I do not sit with my children in a home of my own. And I've stress the my own because she says it three different times in the next two sentences. I still long for a hearthstone of my own. I wish it for my children's sake far more than for my own. Uh, this, is, this is someone who wants her own space, who's not content just to be free. She wants her domestic space for her family, a place that she controls, a place where um, she will be uh, at the center with her children. But she doesn't have that yet. She's still having to live with Mrs. Bruce. Mrs. Bruce is the woman who actually purchased um, the, the, the narrator's freedom for her, not something that Harriet Jacobs asked for, but it nevertheless took place. So she still hasn't reached that goal yet of having her own space, a room of her own, you might say. But that's where the story really needs to end for Harriet Jacobs to be completely fulfilled. We have a, we have a comment from uh, Dean Smithwick here. He says, we must remind our students that these narrators were exceptional people. Um, for example, Douglas talks about slaves content with their lot in life. Was there any danger that the fact that the, the narrators uh, were so articulate and eloquent, could they be seen as the exception that proved the rule? Only a, only a few of them wrote, wrote narratives. Yeah, the, uh, 
there's no question that anybody who writes an autobiography is exceptional. You know, most most of us do not write our own autobiographies, and uh, and so when we if someone does that. Uh, it immediately marks you as an exceptional person. And in the case of the fugitive slave narrative, it's uh, it's important to try to see that a person like Frederick Douglass or Harriet Jacobs was certainly a a remarkably unusual person with tremendous talent and tremendous determination, and in some cases uh, great connections. Um, so it. If you want to read a narrative by someone who would be much more, uh, clo much closer to what I would call the rank and file, I would recommend that you read um, The Life of William Grimes, a Runaway Slave, written by himself, published in 1825. Um, and if you compare that to the uh, uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, you'll see some very interesting differences not only in terms of how Grimes talks about his experience, but what happens to Grimes in the North. Um, it's the difference between, uh, between two very, very different experiences. Um, yet William Grimes lived uh, to be uh, an old man. And in 1855, the same year that Douglas published My Bondage and My Freedom, Grimes republished his autobiography um, just with a with a few more incidents from later on in his life. Quick uh, question: <clears throat> What sure. happened? What happened to Harriet Jacobs? Harriet Jacobs, once she received her freedom, uh, was was no longer obliged to uh, live in sort of partial hiding the way she did. She um, she became active in the uh, uh, Freedmen's Aid movement. She before the Civil War ended, she was teaching a freedom school for uh, freed people, some of whom were people who, who moved from northern Virginia to Washington, D.C., hoping to find freedom. And uh, Jacobs, along with a number of other um, people who had some training and, and, and had some uh, experience in, um, in leadership, uh, taught a school in Arlington until the war was over. She went back to North Carolina briefly after the war was over. She, um, she had a boarding house in Cambridge, Massachusetts for a number of years. She also uh, worked in uh, reconstruction for the Freedmen's Bureau for a while in Georgia. She had a very active life she wrote a lot of uh, of, uh, of letters about her her work in the Reconstruction movement, and her her daughter spent uh, many years with her. Um, and Harry Jacobs is buried in uh, the Auburn Cemetery in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Okay, fine, good. Um, I'm probably not. I guess we're almost at eight thirty, and I'm probably not going to get to some of these later slides. Um, but it is interesting to show students how uh, Douglas would write about the same experience 10 years apart. So if you um, ask students to look at the way that Douglas uh, tells the story of the battle with Covey in 1845 and 1855, um, it becomes a very manageable assignment. They don't have to read pages and pages and pages and pages of someone's autobiography. They can focus on, um, you know, what, what are the rhetorical decisions that Douglas makes in 1855 to portray the same kind of incident? And uh, one of the things that I think is most remarkable is the way that a black woman named Caroline, this is in slide 41, appears in the narrative of 1845 and the way she reappears in My Bondage and My Freedom in 1855. In 1845, Douglas describes Caroline in one role. Uh, Mr. Covey bought her as a breeder. This woman was named Caroline. She was a large, able-bodied woman, about 20 years old. She'd already given birth to one child. After buying her, he hired a married man of Mr. Samuel Harrison, 
to live with him one year, and him he used to fasten up with her every night. The result was that at the end of the year, the miserable woman gave birth to twins. Um, this, I would argue, um, in the narrative is a way that Douglas portrays an African-American woman primarily as a victim. And then in my bondage and my freedom, he brings Caroline back uh, for another review. And once again, he describes her being purchased as a breeder by the, uh, by the slave breaker, Edward Covey. But when you get to the story of the battle with Covey um, in My Bondage and My Freedom, Caroline makes a very interesting and significant appearance. She does not make an appearance at all in the battle with Kobe in the narrative, but 10 years later in 1855, she makes an appearance. Uh, and, and it's uh, something that I'd strongly recommend that you look at. Um, this appears, well, I'm trying to find where the Caroline passage is, Richard. Uh, that's it right there. Oh, yes, right there. I was just looking at it and went right past it. It's on 41. This is this is while Fred is uh, engaged in this battle with Covey. Um, I saw Caroline coming to the cow yard to milk, for she was a powerful woman and could have mastered me very easily, exhausted as I now was in this kind of pushing and shoving match he's been having with Covey. As soon as she came into the yard, Covey attempted to rally her to his aid. Strangely, and I may add, fortunately, Caroline was in no humor to take a hand in any such sport. We were all in open rebellion that morning. Caroline answered the command of her master to take hold of me precisely as Bill had answered, but in her it was at greater peril so to answer. That is, and she didn't do anything. She just walked away. She was the slave of Covey, and he could do what he pleased with her. It was not so with Bill, and Bill knew it. So in My Bondage and My Freedom, Caroline makes two appearances, and in the second case, she is no longer a victim. She is a strong and powerful woman, could have mastered Fred if she'd wanted to, but instead participates in the rebellion and, in fact, takes a very – um, commanding role because unlike Bill, the hired man who refuses to help Covey throttle Douglas, Bill is not Covey's slave, and Covey can't do anything to Bill if Bill refuses to do what Covey demands. But Caroline is his slave, and so she knows that if she says no to him, there could be real trouble ahead. Nevertheless, she will not help Covey master Fred Bailey. So it's a difference between the way a black woman is portrayed in these two narratives, and I, and I think very worth um, uh, showing students. Um, the, the thing that's striking in incidents over on the uh, 44th slide is really the question of when a slave resists, in a slave narrative, what is the effect? Um, the the way that Douglas describes it, of course, we can understand. It's it rekindles the few expiring embers of freedom, revives within me a sense of my own manhood. This is the the man fighting hand to hand with another man and turning up the victor, and so of course it gives him a great sense of his own manhood, uh, vindicated and revived do this. But what is it like for a woman? Um, well, Harriet Jacobs can't fight Dr. Flint, the man who wants to turn her into his concubine, who wants to render her his uh, sexual victim. She can't fight him physically. So how does she fight him? How does she resist him? Well, as you can see from this passage, um, when he comes in and tells her, about his intended arrangements. That is, he's created this little cottage where he intends for her to go and just be available to him whenever he wants her. Uh, and she tells him, I won't enter it. And he says, you shall go. 
if you're carried there by force, and you shall remain there. And she says, I won't go. In a few months, I shall be a mother. Well, Dr. Flint had no idea that that this girl, who's, who's at this point around 15, uh, would be pregnant. He thinks that uh, he's going to have his way with her for the first time. She's already anticipated what he might do, and so she has initiated this liaison with another man, another white man in the town. Now, she feels initially that this will be a moment of triumph over him, uh, but then notice the paragraph as it plays out. Now the truth was out and my relatives would hear of it. I felt wretched, humble as were their circumstances. They had pride in my good character. Now, how could I look them in the face? My self-respect was gone. So um, these two passages show the tremendous difference it is for uh, a woman to resist and for a man to resist in these two um, narratives. Um, why is it that Jacobs decides to resist Dr. Flint by getting pregnant? Well, the, the uh, slide 45 uh, focuses on a particular uh, passage. It's a very famous passage in Incidents in which she brings the reader very gently to a point in her life when she made the decision. She decided to become a, uh, a sex, to initiate this sexual liaison with this white man. Uh, it wasn't that he forced her. It wasn't that she didn't know what could happen. She says at the end of that paragraph, I know what I did, and I did it with deliberate calculation. Now that's quite an admission for a for a 19th century woman to say that I know what I did. That is, I deliberately entered into this sexual relationship with a man who was not my husband, with a man who was on the other side of the color line, and I did it with deliberate calculation. It wasn't an accident. Nobody talked me into it. I made this decision on my own. And then she goes on to say, well, realize that you, the happy women, that is the women who are reading her narrative, you were free to choose whom you wanted to love, and your homes were protected by law. So don't judge me too severely. I would have liked to have married the man of my own choice. I would have liked to have had a home too, but I wanted, uh, but I, she says, I tried hard to preserve my self-respect, but I was struggling alone in the powerful grasp of the demon slavery, and the monster proved too strong for me. And so she becomes reckless in her despair. This is, I think, an interesting passage. This whole chapter uh, in Incidents is one that could be singled out um, in terms of the, uh, the, the tremendous conflict within the narrator over whether she did wrong or whether anyone has a right to judge her who has not been a slave. And so I point to this passage in, in slide 46. She starts out saying, pity me and pardon me, O virtuous reader, as though the reader were her judge, as though the reader uh, were a woman of high morals, whereas the narrator is someone whose morals have been very compromised. Then she turns around and says, you never knew what it was to be a slave to be entirely unprotected by law or custom, to have the laws reduce you to the condition of a chattel, entirely subject to the will of another. You never exhausted your ingenuity in avoiding the snares and eluding the power of a hated tyrant. You never shuddered at the sound of his footsteps and trembled within hearing of his voice. I know I did wrong. No one can feel it more sensibly than I do. The painful and humiliating memory will haunt me to my dying day. Still, that's the key transition word there. Still, in looking back calmly on the events of my life, I feel the slave woman ought not to be judged by the same standards as others. So she starts out asking for pardon and in the end says, you can't judge me. 
and this is a, this is what makes incidents in the life of the slave girl such a such a powerful story. Uh, this narrator is is not of one mind about what she did. She is of two minds, and her sense of morality, her sense of right and wrong, is always affected by the uh, degree to which choice, the degree to which she could do what she had been taught to do, what she wanted to do, but because of slavery could not have an opportunity to do. So I think that I've gone through this maybe uh, helter-skelter, uh, and I know it's over 8.30, it's now 8.40, but, um, but if there are questions, I certainly would like to try to address them. Well, uh, I, I have one quick question. <clears throat> Is there any indication of how Harriet Jacobs' uh, book was received? Are there any reviews? There were, and the reviews were generally positive. Mm -hmm. um, these were reviews in the anti-slavery press. Um, this, this kind of story would have been just too shocking for uh, uh, people to read and review in, uh, in the larger periodical press. But in the anti-slavery uh, press, it was acknowledged to be a, uh, a, a unique account um, and uh, a story that uh, would be challenging and disturbing, but that needed to be told. Fine. Okay, good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end. Um, here's your last chance for questions or comments. Uh, you can text them in. Uh, please continue to use the forum. Uh, Professor Andrews will monitor the forum until November 5th. So if you do have any questions or comments that you didn't get in this evening, or if you think of any after the seminar, please go to the forum and post them there, and we'll be able to respond with you through the forum. So, ladies and gentlemen, please submit your evaluations. Uh, remember those, as I said, they're very important to us. Thank you very much for your participation. I want to thank Bill for giving us an excellent seminar this evening. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the way you escape the classroom, you go up to the upper left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see the word file. Click on that. There'll be a drop-down menu. And I think the, the last item there is leave session. If you click on that, you're home free. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening.